All right. Welcome, everyone. My name is Heidi Baskfield. I am the Vice President of Population Health and Advocacy here at Children's Hospital Colorado, and I'm going to be your moderator for this evening. Welcome to the Children's Hospital Colorado Mental Health Town Hall. We're super excited to have everybody. We're going to give you some amazing tips on how to help your kids on everything from navigating complicated relationships with friends, preparing for what will obviously be an amazing summer, to thinking about how to prepare for next school year. So join us as we get this started. Before we dive in and have our amazing expert panelists introduce themselves, we're gonna go through a few housekeeping items. So just a few logistics to get out of the way first. Of course, we have to share our legal disclaimer so we can get that out of the way. We want you all to know that live translation is in fact available. So for those of you who need interpretation services, here are the instructions. Please feel free to click on the globe that says interpretation underneath it, select your language, and you can join us uh, in the language of your choice and comfort. We are going to be speaking a little more slowly than perhaps you might experience us in other spaces to be able to keep our interpreters from collapsing on the floor. We are in fact trying to promote mental health even for our interpreters. So please bear with us as we slow it down a little bit for this nighttime fun. All right, let's go ahead and get into the introduction of our panelists. Um, as you can see, we've got a very full agenda tonight. So we have a lot to offer you. And I'm gonna go ahead and start by introducing you to Tripti Sharma. Tripti, please tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're excited about with the summer coming up ahead. All right, hi, thank you so much. My name is Tripti Sharma. Uh, I'm a licensed therapist here in the state of Colorado. Um, I'm also a senior trainer at Partners for Children's Mental Health, where I get to work with professionals from around the state of Colorado, teaching them about mental health and suicide prevention. Um, I am really excited about a Lake Powell trip that I have planned. Very excited about that. Thanks, Tripti. That's fantastic. Let's hope it keeps raining so that if you're planning on spending that time on a houseboat, there's water out there for you. Um, Godspeed. Okay, uh, let's go next to my pal, Lauren Eckert. Lauren, talk to us. Tell us about yourself and what you're looking forward to this summer. Hey everyone, I am Lauren Eckhart. I've been at Children's for just about five months now. Um, that's a really long and big title at the bottom of the screen. What it really means is that I am in charge of behavioral health programming down here in Colorado Springs. Um, we've got a lot of new exciting service lines we're gonna be opening up this summer um, to work with our kids and our families down here. So that's one thing I'm really excited about. Personally, I'm really excited about, I don't wanna say getting back to normal because we all know at this point that's not happening, but getting back to some, some summer fun, spending some time outside, being able to travel without having to worry that it's gonna get canceled at the last second um, and spending time with family. Fantastic, thanks, Lauren. All right, because we don't have enough fun with one Lauren, we're gonna bring on another one. Lauren Henry, please introduce yourself. We never get that joke ever, do we, Dr. Mm -hmm. Ecker? Not at all. Um, I'm Lauren Henry. I'm a child and adolescent psychologist here at Children's. Um, and I'm kind of in a unique role where I get to work more preventatively um, with some of our, our families through school and community consultation efforts. And then I get to see the other end of the spectrum, right? So I work within some of our higher levels of care, serving kids that are actively in a mental health crisis. So I am so, so excited to be here to talk more preventative and, and how do we keep our kids out of those um, acute mental health crises. And then oh, what I'm looking for of the summer, I am going to be a caddy for my sister's special Olympics golf team. And I ha don't golf. I know nothing about it. So I've been watching a lot of, a lot of masters and some boring stuff, but I'm excited for that over the summer. Nice. Thank you. And I'm sure there are YouTube videos on this topic, right? When in doubt, consult YouTube. Um, and that is why we open with a legal disclaimer, because I say ridiculous things like that throughout the program. All right, we're going to go ahead and move into the first part of this series, which is how we really support uh, our children in creating and maintaining healthy friendships. So Tripti Sharma, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Heidi. 
Um, I actually want to start with, you know, everyone, let's just go down memory lane really quick and think about some of those formative relationships and friendships that you had when you were a child and really consider what did you learn from them? How did those relationships add to who you are today, right? And so just using that as the backdrop of um, talking about friendships and the importance of them. So research also tells us that having and keeping friendships is a positive factor for developmental outcomes, um, such as positive self-attitude and being able to carry on and having positive functioning relationships in their futures. So friendships contribute to um, youth's cognitive development and their social development in these varying ways, right? So we get to learn how to belong outside of family relationships. We learn how to get along with others and navigate conflict. We learn social skills. We have, um, you know, our friends really help us try out new things. Uh, and our friends can act as a buffer from different negative events that may happen in our lives. Uh, then, of course, the cognitive development. We learn through our friends, and that's called peer tutoring, cooperative learning, collaboration, and modeling. Uh, how many of you all have um, you know, tried to teach your child something, and then all of a sudden they go you know, to somebody's house or they go to a school and they come back and their best friend did it, so now they just do it automatically. It's so cool how they can learn. So um, there are some things though that you can do to foster your, your children in making friends. So um, what we recommend is, you know, really helping your child learn how to listen to other, others' ideas, um, teaching them how to look out for another child's needs, emotions, and really being able to take on the perspectives uh, so that they can start understanding them. And, you know, that's where we learn some forgiveness and, um, and, and empathy. So really important there. Want to discuss fairness with your children, um, you know, taking turns, how to share, how to solve problems, negotiating, compromising, all those skills. Um, and then, of course, being honest and a loyal friend and why that may be important. Uh, and then, of course, we want to help them learn words for expressing their feelings. So when they do get into some, um, you know, dicey waters, do they have the words to, to say how are they feeling in those situations? Uh, and we want to teach them how to self-regulate, right? So some of those skills uh, that we can teach them uh, in coping with those negative emotions. I love using certain um, breathing apps and things like that. There's a breathe to relax or for some younger ones, um, Sesame Street has the breathe, think, do app um, where they get to pop bubbles and uh, really figure out how to handle situations. And of course, we wanna make sure they know how to handle introductions, they know how to participate in conversations. So these are all the things that you know are basics to teaching uh, them what they can do. We're gonna move over to um, things that uh, you can really do instead of just teaching them, right? So um, we wanna model cooperation and kindness with other people, neighbors, shopkeepers, teachers. Uh, remember, they're always watching you. They're, <laughs> they're watching you a lot. Um, invite their friends over, um, invite your friends over, show them to, enjoy, you know, that enjoyment with friends along with family are important endeavors to you. Uh, find time for your children to play with other children and select activities that really foster cooperation. Uh, and of course, engaging in social clubs or recreational groups, so important. We often find friends doing things that we like to do and that we're passionate about. And, and we wanna praise their efforts. We wanna stay positive. So what are they doing? Picking out those behaviors, uh, those specific words that they're saying and being able to reflect that back to them and say, "You, I really saw your effort there. You did a great job in trying to make that introduction. And then overall, you know, youth are really resilient and being the types of creatures that we are, we inherently want to make connections. So uh, if, if there are some 
um, struggles, let's let's consider some of these ideas. Um, first of all, being okay with variation. Kids are different. Uh, some don't need any support to make friends, and some may have uh, just a few friends, and some may struggle to make friends. If your child is really refusing to engage with peers, ask them why. Get to the root of the problem. You know, are they having difficulty with the separation? Would they benefit from social skills coaching? Or are they okay with how things are? Do they enjoy, you know, quote unquote, sitting on the sidelines? That might be something that they're okay with. Um, and if it's not, let's have them brainstorm ideas, right? Considering when, you know, ask them, when have you been successful in making friends in the past? And really eliciting ideas from them. Uh, and then if that doesn't work, then you can ask for permission from them to share your ideas of things that might help. Um, so some ideas could be like, would it be helpful if we went to this birthday party early or is that too hectic? And do you wanna maybe show up a little bit late once most people are already there? Uh, sometimes taking the mystery out of the situation and doing a run through of what they may be uh, expecting uh, can, can, be really re can really reduce anxiety. And of course, role-playing, role-playing introductions. How do you um, introduce yourself? How do you ask someone to play? How do you stay engaged in those uh, conversations? So when other people are sharing, how do you follow up with questions that you may wanna ask? And I'm a really big proponent of youth learning in a variety of ways. So reading books on friendships or just books with themes of friendships throughout them. And of course, let's not forget the power of storytelling. Storytelling can be so um, can can be so important uh, in the way that we teach youth. So we can um, just share idea things that have happened to us, things that have happened to others. Uh, but one thing I do warn you about when you're storytelling, though, is don't fake it. They can tell. So make sure that you have some genuine stories when you're trying to teach them through stories. So that is just the basics of friendships and why they're so important. And, uh, you know, we're going to continue talking on about when they get a little bit more difficult. Thanks, Tripti. That was really excellent. With all of the changes that have been happening with the pandemic, kids changing schools, coming in and out of virtual and different school settings, really providing helpful tips for parents and caregivers on how they can support their kids uh, with their friends and their healthy relationships is awesome. I want to remind all of our audience that you have an opportunity to ask questions and we will address them after we get through all of the different panelists, but please put those questions in the chat so that we uh, have plenty of time to get to them at the end. All right, we're going to hand it over to Lauren Eckert, who's going to talk about how we get ready for the end of school uh, and make sure that we're prepared to have the best summer ever. Thanks, Heidi. So the, the very first thing I want to remind everybody before we get started tonight um, is the idea that positive events, as much fun as they are, can be really, really stressful. So if you think about some of the happiest things in all of our lives, you know, weddings, births of babies, new jobs, new houses, there's a tremendous amount of stress that goes along with that. And if we as adults feel that, we have to really think hard about what our kids are feeling. And if we have a hard time coping with positive events, what are our kids feeling? Um, a really important thing also to remember is the end of the year can really bring about a lot of mixed feelings. So being really excited to have summer coming up, but also being sad to say goodbye to friends or disappointed that friends might be moving away. That's a particularly difficult thing for our little kids to understand. So your early elementary school kids who still really think about the world in, in black and white um, and very concrete this or that really don't understand and are really confused when they're feeling happy and sad at the, at the same time. And so they're not going to know how to talk to us about it and they're not going to know how to express that. So we really need to be on the lookout for that too. And then the final piece that I want you to keep in mind as we continue to talk about transitioning both into summer, but then back into school in the fall, is that kids and families experience summers very differently. And it depends on a ton of factors. I put just a few on the slide, but if you think about things like childcare and who they'll be with over the summer, or if you think about, you know, access to food or positive peers or emotional support, you know, some families have this very picturesque, 
we're going to go to summer camp and have lake trips and do all this wonderful family togetherness. And for some kids, that brings a, a ton of stress because maybe they don't feel terribly supported by their family. And maybe they're really dreading spending the whole summer at a lake with their family. We have other kids and families whose parents work full time, you know, either a single parent household or a two parent household where kids are going to have to be in daycare or some sort of alternative camp or childcare arrangement all summer and don't actually get any extra family time. And then we think about our kids and our families who are experiencing food insecurity or housing insecurity, where school is a really safe place for that kiddo, where they know they're going to get all of those needs met. And now they're looking at an entire summer of not knowing when or how they're going to be able to eat and whether or not they're going to have a roof over their head and where they're going to even spend their days. So th those are a lot of things to sort of keep in mind over the next few slides when we start talking about what are the specific stressors that our kids may be experiencing with all of this in the background? And then what can we as parents and caregivers do to help support our kids? So just to kind of hit a couple of the big highlights in terms of the end of the year stressors, you've got the, the short-term problems, right? So things like final exams, final projects, presentations, but then you've also got their overall grades for the whole year. So now it's coming into play that we're getting down to the last few weeks. And oh no, that one class, that one grade, am I going to be able to get it high enough to pass? Or am I going to potentially be retained for the year? Or even worse to some of our kids, am I going to have to go to summer school? And am I going to have to admit you know, to my friends that, that I didn't pass this class? Um, or am I going to have to go sit at an awards assembly and see all of my friends go up and not get to go up myself? So that's sort of the academic piece. And then there's the social piece that Tripti already spoke to. We have you spend an entire year developing relationships with kids in your class, with teachers, with school bus drivers, with coaches. Our kids latch on to the positive adults in their environments and then have to leave them for a whole summer. And that can be really, really hard to understand. And then we also have kids who are going to be transitioning to completely new schools in the fall. Sometimes that's because they're going from elementary school to middle school or middle to school to high school, or maybe they're moving or maybe they know a friend is moving. We experience a lot of that down here in Colorado Springs where we have families that are involved with our military and our military service members and they frequently have to transition during the summers. So kids are now dealing with the fact that their person who has been their best friend all year may not be back in the fall at all. And then we also have end of the year activities. So again, positive events are fun, right? But then you have concerts, these award assemblies, field days, field trips, all of those things throw kids off their routine at a time of year when their routine is really the most important thing. So all of these activities, of course, are at night. So then you have your kids staying up later at night, but then they still need to get up in the morning to go to school to do those final projects and to take those final exams. So we're putting stress on an already stressed system. And then that's when we really start to see um, potential some concerns or some concerning behaviors. So some of the things to keep an eye out for and keeping in mind that our kids either may not be willing to talk about what they're thinking and feeling or may not be able. These might be our little kids that don't understand how to say I'm happy and I'm sad or I'm excited and I'm scared. Or they might be our older kids who were just not cool anymore, to be honest, and they don't want to tell us. So you've got to be on the lookout for changes in their behavior. That's one of the biggest things that we talk to parents and caregivers and teachers and adults about is watch for significant changes in your kids' behaviors. If you have a kid who's usually super outgoing, super excited, very easy to talk to people, and all of a sudden they're shy, that's generally speaking a sign that something's going on. Something's worrying them, something's upsetting them, something's making them sad. Um, so looking for changes is the biggest piece of advice that I can give. Some other things that you might see, increased physical complaints. We've all heard this one before. I can't go to school, I have a headache, I have a tummy ache, my pinky right toe hurts. Um, all of the things that, that they can come up with. You might see some changes in their sleep patterns. You might see some short temperedness or some irritability. Again, stress on stress. How do we all feel at this time of year? I'm living this one right with all of you. I have a nine-year-old and I have an almost six-year-old who are finishing third grade and kindergarten. So this is, this is my life right now too. Um, they're a little short tempered. We're a little short tempered. So then everybody gets long tempered. Um, everyone's a little bit drained. So you start to see these behavioral concerns come up, issues that you haven't maybe seen in a while, issues that you haven't heard about in a while. You've got your younger kids fighting with each other again. You've got your teenagers stomping around and using some not such choice words, um, some more distancing from you. 
Um, we can see kind of two different options around schoolwork. You can see more of that procrastination, like, nope, not doing it, not doing it, not doing it until right before it's due. Or you see the kids who just give up entirely and just sort of kind of say, forget it. I'm not going to pass anyway. There's no point. I'm too far behind. I just give up and they refuse um, to do anything at all. Next slide, please. So what can we do? How do we help our kids in this situation? And how do we in turn, you know, help ourselves? Because if our kids are stressed, we're going to be stressed. So the goal is to reduce their stress, reduce our stress, and to have everybody have a, have a better experience. So the first key thing to think about is predictability. Kids thrive when their environments are structured and predictable, when they know what's coming, when it's coming, how it's coming, and what they're going to be expected to do. And like we talked about, the end of the year gets really unpredictable because you have all of these events you don't usually have. You're going different places after school and other places on the weekend, and maybe you're even traveling. So how do we help kids to understand that? How do we help them to know what's coming? Use a calendar. You know, if, if you have older kids and you can link calendars on a phone, that's great. If not, I'm a huge proponent of the dry erase board on the refrigerator or the old school calendar. And you can write all the different weekend activities. If you've got younger kiddos, you can use stickers or drawings or pictures just so they can see, you know, what's coming down the pike. Talk to the kids about what's coming. Talk to them about, okay, this week we have, you know, your final chorus concert on Tuesday. So instead of coming straight home after school, you're going to stay and we're going to have dinner after the concert. Talk them through what's coming for that day and then the next couple of days so they always know kind of what's happening and they don't have to worry about when and how and where. Um, you might have to think about, do I need to simplify my schedule right now? Do I really have to go to every single end of the year event for all of my four kids? Because by the time you do the end of the year class party, the field day, the barbecue, you know, you're going to be busy seven nights a week. So you might need to sit with everybody in the family and decide, okay, how do we want to prioritize each of these events? What's most important to each kiddo about their end of the year celebrations? Which ones do they want their siblings or their parents or their grandparents at? Or which ones do they maybe want to do alone? Make sure to involve your kids in those discussions because what we think is important may not at all be what they want or think is important. Help your kiddos plan for those tough goodbyes. Goodbyes are a challenge for all of us. How do we make sure that they have the opportunities to say what they want to say or to do what they want to do? Do they want to write cards or draw pictures? Do they want to make sure they exchange phone numbers for our kids who right now are still too young to have phone, you know, cell phones? For our early elementary school kids that, you know, we're not going to give a phone or tell them to go, you know, sit on a computer and, you know, FaceTime or Facebook. You know, how, how is a kindergartner going to keep touch with their best friend over the summer? Have those conversations. Make sure they get enough sleep every night. We've got to do the best that we can amongst all these activities to get kids to bed so they can do well on those exams. One of the biggest things, check in with your kids regularly, daily, if even. This doesn't have to be a long 45-minute conversation. Um, some of our favorites to talk to parents about are ask for your kids' highs and lows for the day. Ask for something that was hard and easy. Ask for something that was good and bad. And then keep hammering at it. Your kids aren't going to give you an answer every day. Your teens are going to roll you their eyes at you the first 15 times you do it. But if you keep doing it and you keep doing it, eventually they're going to say something because they know that you're not giving up and they know that you're there and you're creating a safe space for them to express themselves. The second part of that is when they do express themselves, you have to listen. Tripti talked at the beginning about the importance of friendships and listening. We as parents are horrible listeners because we want to fix it. Our kids are sad. Our kids are scared. Our kids are happy and we want to fix it. We want to make it better for them right away. We don't want them to feel uncomfortable. I don't know about you all, but when I get in situations where I'm emotional, I don't want anybody to fix it right away. I want someone to be there and to be able to say, you're right. That's really hard. I'm sorry. Not, well, you could do this and you could do this and you could do this and then it will be all better and it won't be a problem. I don't want to hear that. I want someone to sit with me and say, I can see why that would be really hard. How can I help you figure that out? So really acknowledging their feelings, sitting there with them with those feelings, validating them. I understand why you feel that way. I could see how that could make you feel like that. I would be sad too if I heard my best friend was leaving. Don't just tell them, oh, it'll be all right. You'll make a new friend next year. You know, our kindergartners don't understand that and our high schoolers don't want to hear it. We've got to sit with them. And you've got to resist the urge to fix it until they're ready. So kind of what Tripti talked about earlier, you know, what would you think about or would it help if 
having those conversations once you've let them have that safe emotional space to talk about how they feel. Then helping to teach and practice calming skills. Tripti already talked about deep breathing. That's certainly one of our favorites. Others are around kind of how to address your emotions and how to self-soothe, how to, when you're upset, to distract yourself or to make yourself feel a little bit better. We talk all the time with our families about creating coping skills boxes, having um, things that you can touch, having pictures of a favorite people, having sounds, your earbuds that you can listen to, having a hard candy in your pocket, things that are going to make you feel better and having those things in a consolidated place so that you know where they are when you need them. You can send a small Ziploc bag in a kid's backpack to school. This doesn't have to be a giant Tupperware container filled of their biggest stuffy ever. One or two small fidget toys, a picture of mom or dad, a picture of the best friend. Um, those work great. Lastly, and most importantly, practice what you preach. Make sure you take care of yourself. Get good sleep for yourself. Eat well, get exercise. Check in with your friends and your family members and the people that support you and find a safe space to talk about what you're feeling and how you're coping with this end of the year. Last slide, please. So what do you do over the summer? Because these concerns don't just go away the day that school is over. Keep checking in. Understand that their thoughts and their feelings are going to change over time. You know, Dr. Henry will get this, to this in a minute, but once we get so closer to getting back to school, they're going to start worrying about, again about all of those things that were happening at the end of the year. So be ready for those to change. Continue to hear them, continue to acknowledge, continue to validate, continue to sit with them. And when they're ready, help them problem solve. Do as much as you can to keep the home schedule and routines as similar as possible. Keep trying to get good sleep. I know it's tempting to let people stay up super late at night because they may not have to get up as early in the morning, but that we all know that's not gonna end well for somebody most days. Encourage them to connect with their school friends. This is especially important, again, for those littles who we can't, you know, hand a cell phone or a tablet or a computer. You might have to call and set up some play dates, and you might even have to encourage some of your older kids. You know, our, our kids are really in this digital world now. How do we encourage them to get face-to-face -face with their friends? How do we push them away from those computers and phones and, and get them outside and get them physically with their friends? Find time to make moments special and meaningful. We talked at the beginning about how summer is really different for everybody. It's not about quality. It's not about quantity. It's not about any of those things. It's about taking whatever moments that you have and that you have together and making them special and making them meaningful. It could be five minutes. It can be five weeks. Sit with your kids, put down your phones, make them put down their phones and find something you can do. It can be hot dogs for 4th of July, you know, s'mores, walks at the park, whatever you all enjoy, but, but figure out how to make time and make it special and then have fun. Thanks, Lauren. That was Absolutely. amazing. Like bringing calm to chaos. So, so helpful to know that there are things that we can do, how to spot the signs and then all the resources that you gave us to be able to address the challenges our kids are going to have really mm -hmm. outstanding. Thank you. Absolutely. But, now we're going to go to Lauren Henry, who's going to talk to us about the rest of the summer and gearing up for a successful start to the next school year. So Lauren Henry, floor is yours. Great. And my other Lauren really set me up um, for talking about the, the things that help our kids. <laughs> thumbs up, things that help our kids be successful at the end of the school year, um, really trying to carry those through the summer. All right? Even though right, we know we're going to get from our kids it's summer break, right? I don't want structure and I don't want routine and do not make me right. Do that 30 minutes of math, right? We, we do know, I think Lauren, you used the word thrive and I have thrive written all in my notes, right? That this is truly where our kids are successful, right? And where we can really support our kids' mental health is consistency, right? You are going to hear that word from me probably six or seven more times, right? And we get that with structure, right? Now, I, I don't want you to already feel exhausted. Like you think that we're recommending that parents and caregivers bring out the same amount of structure that an entire team of school professionals do every single day, right? We're not looking for that bell to bell scheduled, right? With three minute passing periods, right? Now we're on to lunch and now we're on to afternoon karate. And now we're on what we are looking for, right? Is basic structure and wait for it consistency, right? By far, 
most important. We get asked a lot around really specific details around our kids' structures throughout the day, right? Do, do I need to have them do six or seven chores, right? Or 30 minutes of math or, you know, 10 books. What, what is that gold star, right? And what you'll hear from most of us here, right, is not getting into that nitty gritty, right, of what each little expectation is, but that those expectations are applied with consistency, right? I have a little clip art here on, on the screen, right? If, if you can see, this is not minute by minute scheduled, right? But something that as parents and caregivers, we're going to be able to follow through with consistently, told you, you're going to get tired of hearing that word, but that's what's going to keep our kids in a very safe and productive space over the summer and prepare them for school in the fall. All right. Um, I think we can go ahead and go on to that, that next slide. I want to make sure we save time for some questions. All right. So the next really important thing, right, this, you might have heard it called the summer slide or the summer setback. There's lots of fun little names we've come up with for what research shows, right? Data is a little bit mixed, but anywhere from 20 to 30 percent, right, of the content that our kids are learning throughout the school year, right? They're, they're losing, right, or forgetting over the summer. That's a huge chunk. Right. So we want to to think about ways, strategies, routines, consistency, right, on how we're going to to prevent our children from falling behind. Right? We know there's an incredibly strong link right, between our kids academic performance and their mental health outcomes. Right. And behavioral health outcomes. So it's, you know, not getting on here to talk about all academic work. Right. But know that there is a link. Right. And if we can support our kids academic success over the summer and going into the fall. Right. We are also supporting their mental health. Right. So what's great is that really formal, comprehensive, sometimes expensive programs work. But what also works right, are some of these strategies here right? Smaller but consistent routines of education over the summer, right? So my first, first tip being a school psychologist by training is going to be collaborate with your schools, right? They want your kids to be successful too. They, they often have summer reading lists, right? And they have um, often kits that they can send home over their summer. They have resources, right? To connect you with over the summer, whether it's a paid tour, tutor or a YMCA after school program, right? Please collaborate with your schools. Ask your school, your child's teacher, right? Counselor, what academic supports are available over the summer? There's also an incredible, you know, just wealth of, of um, electronic activities, right? These education apps that are readily available. Um, Tripti spoke to, to some mindfulness and friendship apps, right? This is where we can use that, that screen time to our advantage, right? You can sure be on your, your iPad as long as you're doing, you know, scholastic math. Right. And then we can do something else fun. Right? But use utilizing these resources that are readily and, and, and free, right? For for our homes and in the community. Um, who create a reward system? Oh, this is where, you know, if I if my expectations changed over the summer and they said, you know, we're not going to pay you for continuing to come into work. I sure love my job. I'm not saying that because all of my bosses are on this call, right? But I don't know if I would keep coming, right? If that paycheck stopped, there's something to be said of how important it is to show our children that the expectations we have for them, they're going to be worth it, right? And ultimately, the, the world will reinforce them for doing the helpful things, for picking up that book and reading, right? It's going to help them later on. They're not looking that far ahead, right? We oftentimes with our kids, we need to have kind of this bridge reward, right? Or this bridge consequence that links, right? Helps them learn and understand those natural positive things that happen, when we do things like read 30 minutes a day over the summer, 
right? So I encourage you any reward or incentive, um, I don't know, strategies you have right now, continue those over the summer. Um, let's see. Let's, yeah, let's move on to the next slide. Oh, I love this. I have this posted in my house um, because oftentimes I need a very clear reminder of here is one outdoor or indoor physical activity you can do. Right. And this is what we're looking at is that children don't just right. They don't just lose academic knowledge during the summer, but that physical fitness, right. Social engagement, they also take a hit. So planned spontaneous activities that we can embed throughout our child's daily schedule can, can just be incredibly, incredibly important. Right. So having some kind of outdoor play expectation built in, right. Um, our community has incredible resources. I just heard that Planet Fitness, this is not a, a plug for them, but I was so impressed that they are allowing um, high school students age 14 to, to 18 to come in and work out for free over the summer, right? There's, there's so many more available um, and free resources, right? Whether it's um, certain incentives they do at the, at the zoo and promotions there or and, taking different hikes throughout, right? Really trying to, to utilize our community um, that, that has a lot of readily available supports. Um, YMCA is also another really good resource, right? A lot of after school programs, some even targeting and really focusing on our kids' mental health. Team sports, clubs, organizations. I was a 4-H camper myself, right? Anything that we can, again, in a planned, oh, look, it's on the TV. Yes. Um, I'm, oh, I shouldn't read the chat while I talk. It's going to get me all messed up, right? But any social um, opportunities that we can schedule in our child's day, right, to support their mental health now. And it's also going to help them transition back to school later, right? Continuing that, that planned social engagement. Um, I also just want to encourage you to always look for financial aid opportunities, right? Most, I would say most as I'm going through different camps that I'm trying to connect our families with, um, after school programs or, um, I'm saying after school, just, just academic programs over the summer, many have scholarship and financial aid available, right? Look, ask Right. We have some here at the university that that have scholarship components to them. So certain please, please ask about any way to support financially these these summer activities that can be um, a little bit more rigorous in, in nature. OK, last I'm, do, I'm doing great on time. Here we go. Summer screen time. Now, my Lauren duo spoke a little bit about this um, and what I hope for you all is to limit our power struggles this summer. I want to, my very best right, to go in with some expectation, right, with some consistency that can really support you all and not getting into this back and forth of how much screen time or does this phone call count as screen time, or does my math game count as screen time? Um, what I really encourage, one, is to make screen time contingent, right? Utilize this, this technology that, that our kids are really, it is, it is a part of their daily life, and it will be a part of their daily life, right? Utilize it, right? We have to walk, if you go back to our checklist, right? Here we have to, we have to get up, we have to eat breakfast, right? We have to go, we have to do our one outside activity. We have to read for 30 minutes and then you've got two hours of, of screen time, right? This is right, but making it contingent, right? Making it dependent on completing those other activities throughout the day, right? We know that the time, I say two hours, I'm sure some of you are like, oh my gosh, she's the worst parent, right? And that's not, not always true with the two hours, but it, it's also summertime, right? Being lenient, being flexible in some of that, that screen time and how much you allot, right? But making sure that we're getting in those physical activities, the social activities, the academic activities, right? Structure your day in a way, in a way where this really wanted and sought after screen time can support those initiatives. 
Um, and then, yep, expectations and consistency. I had to throw it in there one last time, right? So your child doesn't say, no, you said 30 minutes today, right? That we make it very clear of how long they have. Um, and then there's just a little tip on this, this screen here about how we structure our screen time, right? Not making the next activity after screen time, the least preferred, right? If I have to go from playing, oh, or my husband playing this bubble game on his phone, he has to do that to going to the dishes, 100% chance the dishes are not getting done, right? It's a really trying to make these, what they're transitioning from or to, um, that, that that is not the, the least preferred out of all of their activities. So that's just a, a really helpful, small little thing that can make a big difference. Okay, on time, I did it. Genius, genius. Way to hit the consistent time. <laughs> limit, Lauren. Nicely done. Um, I know everyone appreciated that. I have to say, as you were talking about summer camps, I broke out into a hot sweat thinking about the summer camp Excel spreadsheet that as a working household we have had to maintain that is going to warrant my own therapy uh, at a future date. So for all of you parents out there who are similarly disposed, I feel you. All right, we've got some great questions we wanna to get to. The first is really, um, I'm gonna send over to Lauren Eckhart and that is, we have a 14 year old who's talking a lot about being sad but not really knowing why. She's ending school, she's moving to high school. What are the ways to have her open up about how she's actually feeling? Right, Heidi, that is a great question. So we talked about a little bit, but we can go into a little bit more detail. Really starting that daily check-in. Um, and giving your daughter a safe space to be able to start to, to talk. It sounds like she is expressing herself reasonably well if she's already telling you that she's sad and that she doesn't know why. So that's amazing. So obviously she feels safe talking to you and feels like, you know, she's able to do that. So now how do we get to kind of the next steps, which like we said earlier, can be really confusing to understand. Um, I encourage you not to focus too much on why. Uh, when we give kids a lot of what, why, when questions, they start to feel like they're, they're being attacked and that they have to have an answer and they may not actually have an answer. So you could encourage her to share kind of around that. So if she can't tell you exactly why or doesn't want to tell you why, can she tell you the situations when it's the worst? Can she tell you the time of the day that it feels the worst? Can she tell you the people that are around when it's the worst? She, can she tell you the thoughts that are happening in, in her head. And that will start to give you guys some cues about, you know, what she's thinking and what she's feeling and some direction of where to go next. Remembering to kind of try and stay away from the, well, it'll get better soon. You'll be safe. High school will be okay. It won't be that bad to the, I, I could see why that would be really hard. Can you tell me what you're most worried about? Could you tell me what makes you the most sad? Who are you afraid of missing the most um, and giving her the opportunities and the safe spaces to, to start to say things, which will then encourage her to say more. This sounds a little bit silly, but putting on, you know, some really old school movies about, you know, school years ending and school year starting and seeing what she kind of relates to, just like Tripti talked about at the beginning, storytelling is great. So are movies or TV that kids relate to and asking, you know, how similar do you feel to that? Or what does it seem like that character is feeling? A lot of times our kids, even our older teens, can't really say how they would feel, but they can talk about how a friend would feel or how a character in a movie or a story would feel. That's super helpful. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Lauren Henry, we have a question on what's the appropriate age for cell phones and online communication? And how can we ensure for children's safety when they're online and exploring the internet? Absolutely. It's such a good question. And I wish more than anything, I could give you all an exact year where you say, nope, Children's Hospital, Dr. Henry says eight or nine or 10. And that is just not the answer we can give, right? What we are looking for to keep kids safe, right? Using electronics are those clear expectations and rules, right? That are monitoring of their cell phones, of their, I saw the, the online game consoles. That's something personally I'm worried about, right? Is 
that, that level, that amount, our intensity of supervision is going to, that's going to fluctuate with age, right? Earlier on, we're going to have to have more privacy settings, right? There's lots of those available for different carriers, different consoles, right? Of how you can safely monitor your kids' online activity, right? And then I will also go back to something, my Lauren Pear, right? About this, this open communication, right? And how, if, if one of our children is, they're going to be exposed to something unsafe, what we want to ensure is that there is an open line of communication with us, right? So really encouraging, highlighting, even rewarding, right? When our kids come to us with unsafe things that they have experienced over not just technology, but also technology. That would, you know, it's a roundabout answer, but lots more supervision earlier on, right? And then as we work to, to develop that independence later, we can start pulling back on some of those, um, kind of the, some of those safeguards. But early on, right, under the age of 12, there should be lots and lots of monitoring of of those online activities. If I could hop in for a second on that one, Lauren. I got a great rule of thumb um, that I heard re- actually fairly recently. And then if you think about teaching kids to use the internet and all of these resources, like we think about teaching them to ride a bike or drive a car, kids now are, are digital citizens. They're going to be using all of these things forever. We're not going to be able to prevent it, just like we're not going to prevent them from driving a car and needing that. So we've got to teach them how to do it and how to do it safely. And just like Lauren said, with tons of supervision at first, with the bike helmet and the knee pads and the elbow pads and us looking over their shoulders with all the parental concerns, but then you start slowly taking those things off and you're teaching them how to look both ways and you're teaching them which side of the road to ride on and you're teaching them what are the warning signs to look out for when the car is getting a little bit too close or what to do differently when it's raining or it's snowing. Um, And that was really helpful for me as, you know, my son is approaching the age of we're starting to have these conversations and how do I make sure he's safe? And I can sort of go back in my head to, okay, like we've done this before. It was a different kind of thing, but he learned how to ride a bike and now I trust him to ride the bike. Um, So how can I do this and approach this in the same way? So that was helpful for me. So I hope it helps some of you guys. That's great. Uh, Both of you. Thank you so much. Hey, Can I add to that a little bit? Sorry. Yes. Keep going. There's no shortage of good things to share. Um, you know, depending on, on youth and, you know, your family structure, it might look different, right? Right now I have a 10 year old niece and an eight year old niece that got Facebook messenger at the same time, you know, different ages, things like that. But, um, what we have decided to do as a family is to really encourage them to contact family members, right? Let's start these, um, texting and video chatting and all of these things in these safe environments where you're practicing these skills. And you also practice things like, let's not bother Auntie Tripti while she's working, <laughs> even though I get out of school at three o'clock. Um, so we, uh, you know, just practicing and modeling within the family is such an important part of that as well. That's great. Tripti, I'm gonna stick with you. I'm gonna ask you a question. As we're encouraging super fun play dates, Uh, between our kids and our friends. Sometimes our kids are going to other houses and we don't necessarily know what that environment is like. How do we ensure that we keep our kids safe uh, and encourage healthy relationships as we're allowing them to go into homes and, and be with families that we don't know that well? Yeah, and I think you, you, you nailed that point. We might not know them that well. And so how do we get to know them? Uh, how do we encourage times where we are spending time together? You know, depending on, on how you feel, you might want to have some time that you're doing things outside together as like a family, as a groups of people. And then once you get comfortable with that, then being able to transition to, yeah, sure, you can go over to that person's house. And I think um, we really need to make sure that uh, we are comfortable with the environments that our youth are going to be in. That's great. Thanks, Tripti. All right, I'm going to my friend, the school psychologist, Lauren Henry, with the next question, sensory overload. This is a thing. Uh, And besides quiet spaces, weighted blankets, and sensory swings, 
What are some other things that we can do to support our youth when they're having these moments of sensory overload, which are increasingly common? It's such a good question and a couple of different angles that I think are really important to, to look from. One is like you've already given us some great ideas of things we can do to calm our children's brains is also starting to build up and actually continuing to build up um, a child's tolerance, right? Their brain's tolerance to handle right? Lots of stimulation. Um, there's there's almost only so much of the bubble that we can keep them in, um, even over the summer, right? Of, you know, it, when you're overwhelmed, you can go use the weighted blanket or you could go take a walk outside, really helpful strategies. And we also want to start to prepare our children, right? For either having to use strategies that are, that are not so invasive, right? Some deep breathing or some, um, some mindfulness, but also building up this tolerance to teach our children's brains, we can handle this. This is hard and this is uncomfortable and it is overwhelming, right? And I'm feeling it physically in my body and it's uncomfortable, but I can handle this, right? And I can stay seated and, and do this where I can keep having this conversation, even though there's so much going on around me. Right. It's, it's such a really kind of double, double answer, sided answer, right? And how important it is to keep looking for strategies. I know we have a lot in our parent resource um, center on, on our website. And then, then also the other side, right, of, of how important it is not to, to always pull our children out of those situations as we build up their brain's tolerance to handle lots of stimulation, because this world will give it to you. That's great. Thank you. Lauren Eckhart, we have kids who don't always know when they're stressed and overwhelmed. Uh, I have one who doesn't always realize how uh, stressed he is when he gets hungry. Being hangry is a thing. So for these kids, when they're getting stressed and overwhelmed and they don't necessarily know it, how do we help them with transitions? It's a great question. So the first thing that we can do is as parents and caregivers or teachers or coaches or whatever your kind of role is, helping you to to keep an eye out and to look and to see what are the signs that you're noticing that the kiddo is starting to escalate or starting to get stressed and then talking to the kiddo about that. They may not be and probably aren't most of the time aware of what are the early signs in their body that stress is happening. So really you as the adult or the older you know, teen starting to pinpoint what those things are and then being able to say to, to your child, Hey, it looks like you're starting to get stressed. I'm seeing you clench your fist, or I'm hearing your voice get a little bit higher, or I'm hearing that you're talking a little bit faster. Usually that means you're starting to get upset about something. You know, what can we do to help right now? And what can we do to, to help this not kind of get any worse? We talk a lot about anger thermometers, and that doesn't necessarily have to be anger. It can be anxiety. What does your body feel like when you're at a zero? And what does your body feel like when you're a 10? And if it's a kid that can't really talk about their body, what does your brain do when you're at a zero? And what is your brain doing when you're at a 10? And then what are the things that someone can do to help you at a zero and a 10? Because they're going to be really, really different. What, what might work at a two, you know, a piece of gum or a fidget toy is not going to do anything when I'm a 10. And when I'm a 10, everyone just needs to walk away and leave me alone. So helping kids start to fill that in at the beginning, they're probably only going to be able to tell you zero, five, and 10. But then as you get to practice and they get more comfortable and you get more observant and they get more aware, you can fill in those smaller pieces. And then you can help get involved sooner and stop it from going so high. We talk to kids a lot about a, a giant, you know, pick your favorite soda or carbonated beverage. Every time there's a stress, you shake it a little bit. And kids... And then you kind of talk about, okay, well, what happens when you open a Coke bottle that's been shaken? Well, it explodes everywhere. Okay. So what's the trick? Well, you twist it a little bit. Well, okay. So using a coping skill right here is like twisting it a little bit. We let off some of those bubbles so we don't have a giant kind of explosion everywhere. And if you're up for the mess, it's a great one to take outside and shake up a Coke bottle and let, let kids really see it because then that sort of sticks with them. Most of the time, kids can tell you what their explosion looks like. So how do we avoid their explosion compared to, you know, the Coke explosion. Lauren, that's amazing. I know who's going to be on the other end of my text to call a friend. Uh, when I have questions, one of the perks of working at a children's hospital, these are the people that you get to ask in meetings, your questions about your own kids. 
I can't thank our panelists enough. This has been so insightful and helpful as a mom, unbelievable amounts of resource and support. Tripti as a trainer with our partners in children's mental health, doing so much great work out in the community. If you have some interest in taking some amazing trainings, I encourage you to visit the PCMH website and spend some time with Tripti. Lauren Henry and Lauren Eckhart, also incredible resources that you have provided. And we have some additional information that is coming in the chat. If everyone sees the links that are coming through there, we have some additional links here, uh, as you can see. And uh, there will be information that is going to be made available to those who have attended uh, online following the program. So I wanna thank everybody for joining us this evening. Want to thank uh, our interpretation service. I hope you're still out there okay. Want to be able to make everybody aware of a super cool event happening tomorrow night, Friday Night Lights. The details here about this great event that helps raise money for an important cause being held at Empower Field at Mile High. So cost is free, but you're showing up makes a difference. So please join us six to nine in Power Field at Mile High tomorrow. Weather's going to be great. No rain. So please be there. Thanks again for joining us this evening. Have a great rest of your night. Thank you all.